from around the world. Welcome to the Forward Thinkers webinar series organized by the World Future Council. My name is Alexandra Wandel. I'm Executive Director of the World Future Council, and I'm be delighted to be moderating this session on the topic of COVID-19, Forest Offering Solutions to Recovery. It is held on the occasion of the International Day on Forests, which raises awareness on the importance of all types of forests. And on each International Day on Forests, countries are encouraged to undertake local, national, and global action for forests and trees, such as tree planting campaigns. The theme for 2021 is Forest Restoration, A Path to Recovery and Well-Being. Our webinar will highlight the significant role forests play for the health of people, animals and the environment and it will highlight the Future Policy Gold Award winner Rwanda's Forest Policy and we will also hear about the Great Green Wall for the Sahara and activities of World Resources Institute and the Green Belt Movement. So the webinar is live streamed on the Facebook pages of World Future Council, the Great Green Wall and the UN Convention to Combat Desertification. In the International Young Forest, the World Future Council celebrated the Future Policy Award on the topic of forests. This award is the first award that's given not to a person, but to a policy that effectively improves the lives of current and future generations. Every year, the World Future Council identifies one topic of particular relevance where policy progress is very urgent. And the aim of the award is to raise global awareness for exemplary policies and to speed up action. The World Future Council aims to pass on a healthy and sustainable planet with just and peaceful societies to our children and grandchildren. To achieve this, we focus on identifying, highlighting, and spreading effective future just solutions for current challenges facing humanity. In the next one and a half hours, we will be hearing from Mr. Ibrahim Chao, who is the Executive Secretary of the UN Convention to Combat Desertification. We will then hear from the next speaker, the Honorable Minister Dr. Jan Dark Mujavama Jira, Minister of Environment of the Republic of Rwanda. We will then have an interview with Manjira Matai, who is the Vice President and Regional Director for Africa of the World Resources Institute, also the Chair of the Vangari Matai Foundation and Councillor with the World Future Council. And last not but least, we will be then hearing also from Louise Baker, who is the Managing Director of the Global Mechanism at UNCCD. So you see, we have a wonderful panel today and we look also forward to your questions. You can raise your questions in the comment session under the chat. Thank you. So thank you all distinguished panelists for accepting our invitation and making time to speak with us today. We will now start with a video from Mr. Chow, who is the Executive Secretary of UNCCD. Dear friends from the World Future Council, thank you for the opportunity to be here. There is a Nigerian proverb that says, it's from a small seed that the giant Iroko tree has its beginning. It fits perfectly with this year's International Day of Forest theme, which is to forest restoration, a path to recovery and well-being. Because the seedlings and saplings we plant today will become the source of our well-being for generations to come. I will focus today on forest restoration in arid and semi-arid land. Arid lands are often considered as lifeless, treeless, barren lands. It is true that the density of vegetation is lower here than in more humid ecosystems. It is also true that the biodiversity has different characteristics, different species. However, every single tree, every plant, 
every animal, from the elephants and giraffes to the tiniest species, every living species plays an important role, not only to nature, but to humans. Here, people depend on a smaller number of species for their livelihoods, for their survival. In fact, the life and livelihoods of billions of people from around the world depend on two things, few centimeters of fertile soil and few millimeters of rain to produce hardly enough to feed their families. Over and above the terrible death toll due to COVID-19, the world faces a catastrophic economic crisis. The theme of this year's International Day of Forest could not be more relevant. How can we avoid turning the economic catastrophe into a long-term ecological disaster? To put it more positively, how can we rebound from the current crisis by building a better future? A future that smiles to our children and grandchildren. Take Africa, for example. You don't have to be super rich to come up with bold and bright ideas. Countries of the Sahel have planted a bold and ambitious idea. The Great Green Wall of the Sahara and the Sahel is restoring degraded lands. By planting millions of trees across the landscape in a band snaking from the Atlantic Ocean to the Red Sea. Obviously, the Great Green Wall is about planting trees and regreening degraded land, but it's also about planting hope for the youngest population in the world. It's about restoring lost livelihoods. It's about creating jobs, harnessing the abundant solar energy to provide and to improve the income for the people, including young boys, girls, and women. I'm firmly convinced that land restoration unlocks multiple opportunities. It brings degraded land back to production. It feeds the poorest of the poor. It creates millions of green jobs, often in rural and impoverished areas. Restored land, restored forest, store carbon, conserve biodiversity, fight poverty. Land degradation neutrality, as defined in Goal 15 of the SDGs, can have multiple other indirect effects. It can bring peace and security, especially in the resource scarce regions where people fight for the access to land and water. Victor Hugo once said, there is nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. If there is one silver lining from the pandemic, it's because perhaps the time for large-scale restoration has come. As foresters, we can get trees into the landscape. As consumers, we can choose fonio as superfood or shea in our beauty products. The seedlings and samplings we plant will become mighty trees. If we, are, if we are lucky enough to sit under the shade of the Iroko or Baobab in years to come, we can say that path to recovery and well-being started with the seed of a bold and ambitious idea. I wish you a successful International Day of Forest. Thank you. You're muted, Alexander. Thank you. We were now supposed to hear from Mrs. Jan McAlpine, the director of the UN Forum on Forests, who is also a member of the World Future Council. Unfortunately, she has um, fallen ill. She's not able to join us today, but she's sending her best regards and she also told me that she wants to highlight the significant role forests play for people and wildlife. 80% of biodiversity can be found in forests. And forests are a means for sustainable recovery. Investing in forests is essential to build sustainable, resilient and fair societies, withstanding future pandemics and global challenges like climate change and biodiversity loss. I would now like to welcome, and I'm very honored now to welcome our next speaker, Dr. the Honorable Jandak Mujavamardia, 
who is the Minister of the Environment of the Republic of Rwanda. So we're very honored to have her with us. As she has previously been Minister of Education and Minister in the Prime Minister's Office of Gender and Family Promotion, as well as Vice-Chancellor of the prestigious Kigali Institute of Science and Technology, Rwanda. Now, between 1960 and the year 2000, Rwanda actually lost 65% of forests and the country faced many challenges. A trailblazing forest policy was implemented after also the civil war and it put forests at the heart of the recovery process. By the year 2019, Rwanda achieved its goal of not only halting deforestation, but increasing forest cover to 30% a remarkable achievement. Therefore, the Rwandan Forest Policy received the Future Policy Gold Award in the International <clears throat> Year of Forests, and the award was realized in partnership with the UN Forum on Forests, the Food and Agriculture Organization, and the Convention on Biodiversity. The policy was also again updated in 2017 and 2018, and we are very pleased now to have with us the Honorable Minister, so let me ask you, could you please explain to us what were the key drivers leading to the development and adoption of the awarded Rwandan Forest Policy? Thank you very much, uh, distinguished panelists, webinars. Uh, I'm honored to be with you. Going straight to the question, as you are aware, after genocide against the Tutsi in 1994, Rwanda developed homegrown solutions in almost all the domain of country's economy. During this period, there was a huge pressure for land, first to resettle and feed the returning population. These brought about the decision to cut some part of the natural forest of Gishwati, which is now the UNESCO reserve, and Akagera, and a very land for agriculture and settlement. And this has led to a, a significant reduction in the biomass, the diversity, and ecosystem services living forest. However, in a sustainably active, a green grown economy, one that chose to be a natural country with the minimum disturbance of environment and natural resources. We wanted a forest sector benefiting from positive environment in which other national policies, programs and projects especially those dealing with environment, food security, energy, infrastructure, water, land management, and soil conservation, prioritize forestry as one of the key interventions. Our forest policy is a result of our national wide consultation from citizen to decision makers and it was related to the Rwanda Strategic Vision 2020. I thank you. This was my, the, the, the question, the answer to the first question you raised. Yes, so how did Rwanda make forests the bedrock of the economy, leaving no one behind? Yeah, uh, currently, forest resources play important roles to the Rwanda's economy since 2009. Rwanda, since 2009, Rwanda set a national target to reach 30% by 2020. And since then, a reforestation program was adopted. Currently, forests are covering the 30.4%, which is equivalent to 724 
1,662 hectares of the total surface of the country. Of course, there were private sector involvement and made in Rwanda Drive, the construction materials, furniture of good quality and green cooking technologies such as pellet are available on the local market. This generates green jobs and has a significant impact on livelihood improvement. For better management of public forests, the government of Rwanda encouraged potential private companies for partnership in forest management toward climate resilience. And now 36% of public forests are currently managed by private investors for sustainable development under concession agreement with the government. It is also important to note that private smallholder forests are being organized into private forest management units to constitute bigger entities that can attract private investors for proper and profitable management. And through its policy, Rwanda achieved food security, enhanced food security, you have enhanced biodiversity, poverty reduction. So could you please tell us more about how you implement agroforestry in Rwanda? Yeah, in Rwanda's uh, targets, one of Rwanda's targets is to cover 85% of the agricultural land from appropriate agroforestry trees species by 2024, from current status of 56%. The National Tree Seed Center was strengthened now to avail quality tree species ready to be planted and improve agroforestry trees survival rate. And a national program was developed to produce massive agroforestry seedlings at district level, which in return distributed to farmers for planting and maintenance. Every year Rwanda plants around 800,000 hectares of agroforestry. So Randa's forest policy is an inclusive, multi-stakeholder process tackling effectively multiple challenges at once. It serves as a good model for other countries. Which lessons could other countries learn from you? Yeah, what other, other countries can learn from us? Yes, please. Through sound management. The Rwanda forest policy had a general objective to improve the role played by forest resources in the country's economy and biodiversity conservation. The main focus was to make sure that current benefits enjoyed by actual generations will not compromise on the rights of future generations. The main reasons to run from Rwanda are our forest policy helps the, the forest subsector to play an integral role in supporting countries' development goals for sustainable, low carbon, and climate resilient to improve livelihoods of present and future generations. Second, the institutional capacity and actors should be taken into consideration to match the requirements for sustainable for forest management. Third lesson, the private sector should be supported to increase the investments in the forest sector for poverty reduction, employment creation, green employment creation, and improvement of livelihood through sustainable use, conservation, and 
management of forests and trees. Fourth lesson, the small holder forests are as important as big plantations and have a bigger impact on national environment and the economy. So their sound management should be in the main priority of line ministries. Last but not least lesson, Wanda promoted farm forests to produce timber, wood fuel, supply wood and non-wood forest products. Forest extension was also promoted to enable farmers and stakeholders to benefit from management approach and technologies. And Randa, forest policy as, uh, is a very comprehensive, but Randa is also an environmental leader in other policies. You have been also very innovative in terms of combating climate change, uh, reducing plastic pollution. Could you please tell us more about this? Yes, Rwanda, as you know, has been plastic bag free since 2008, when we, we banned the use of plastic bags. The country completely banned plastic bags when other countries around the world started imposing taxes on plastic bags. Offenders smuggling plastic bags can even face heavy fines, but you won't see plastic bags trotting around streets, hanging from trees, and plugging up drains in Rwanda today. Rwanda adopted the law relating to the prohibition of manufacturing, importation, use, and sale of plastic carry bags and single-use plastic items in 2019. We encourage private investors to come in Rwanda to invest in alternative packaging, recycling towards promoting cycle economy. Since that time, Rwanda was nominated cleanest city in Africa, and this came with positive results for choosing being green economy and climate resilience. That is very impressive. I've been myself to Rwanda and I saw how effectively um, you are implementing the forest policy, also the policy on prohibiting plastic bags. So really congratulations and thank you so much for your inspiring words. Yeah, and the resilience of Rwanda is achieving really to put forest at the heart of its efforts to rebuild a country after a crisis. And that is very remarkable. And in the context of the COVID pandemic, we are asking ourselves around the world how a green recovery can look like and we can see Rwanda as a good example. So thank you so much again, Honorable Minister, for joining us. And I'm thank now you. so honored to also have with us today Banjira Matai. Banjira is the Vice President and the Regional Director for Africa at the World Resources Institute. That she's also the daughter of Vangari Matai and chair of the Vangari Matai Foundation and the former chair of the Green Belt Movement in Kenya. And we are very honored to have her as a member of the World Future Council. She has also been selected as one of the 100 most influential Africans by the Af African magazine in 2017 and 2020. So Vangira, so glad to have you with us. Thank you. So could you tell us more about the Green, Green Belt Movement, the organization your mother started in the 70s that mobilized local communities to plant millions of trees? Thank you, Alexandra, and wonderful to be with Louise and Dr. Mujawa Maria. You know, the truth of the matter is listening to the minister is listening to exactly what the, the brilliance of the Green Belt Movement has been. And I think what's wonderful is to see an entire country is so proud of what you're doing, Madam Minister. The entire country focus on the people, focus on livelihoods, and focus on what really matters to build the sort of resilience and cushioning that you need. The good news is it shows. It shows and Rwanda continues to inspire all of us. 
12 years after you banned plastic, the countries around you have started to ban plastic. 12 years. So I'm really proud to share this podium with you today. The Green Belt Movement is really in many ways encapsulated in what, what the minister said. It is how you work with local communities. It is a really good example of a grassroots movement that focused on the wisdom of local women who are farmers already and have so much wisdom about how to produce food. And it was about producing seedlings and greening the landscape initially around them. So it was about creating belts of green around your farm, around your home, and ensuring that those trees that they were planting were trees that were local to the area. So they just looked around, just like they did with their food crops. They looked around and they were able to see that these trees look very beautiful. So I'll have more of those. Some of those trees were fruit trees, so they gave them fruit. Some of those trees were fodder trees, so they were able to feed their animals. And some of those trees also had lots of branches as indigenous trees tend to do. And so they were also sources of fuel. And even in this 40, close to 44 years that the Greenbelt Movement has been in existence, it has really been about transforming the lives of local communities and giving them the sense of agency that they can do it themselves. And if we are going to win the battle against climate change on this continent, it will be about investing in that very uh, cadre of women, youth, who are often forgotten, but they are the ones who hold the key to building the sort of resilience and nature-based solutions that we are talking about. Because they are the custodians, not only of our food systems, but they're also the custodians of our water systems. They're the custodians of our forests. And so a lot of what we need to do is to learn from those examples and begin to invest in very locally led grassroots movement that will continue to transform their lives. We need people across the board. We need great policies as we have heard about in Rwanda, but we absolutely need the sort of investments that will invest and believe in local communities like the Greenbelt Movement did and continues to do. So Wanjiwa, your mother, the late Professor Matai, who also received the Nobel Peace Prize, she would have turned 81 this year in April. And can you share any words of wisdom that she passed on to you that still ring true today? Well, she passed on a lot of wisdom and I'm, I'm really happy we had um, at last year in April, we started a campaign, Wangari at 80, because she turned, she would have turned 80 last April. And it's coming to 81 this April, but the entire year has been about remembering and celebrating the wisdom that she shared. And if you're following the Greenbelt Movements and the Wangari Mathai Foundation, they are sharing quotes from her. And a lot of those remind me of the nuggets that she shared. And so every time someone asks me this question, a different one comes to mind. And so the one that's coming right now is this idea of um, the, the optimism, that we must be optimistic. And we do not have an option to not be optimistic about what is possible. We cannot give up on our people. And so she always said that every cloud has a silver lining and you are responsible for finding that silver lining and hanging on to it. I really love that because every time I feel overwhelmed, uh, I feel like I, you know, how are we going to address this issue? I remember that, that if I look closely enough, I'll find that silver lining and I'll be able to hang on to it. So obviously you take the wisdom of your mother very serious, being optimistic. You're yourself a leading voice in environmental and women's and social justice movements in Africa. So can you tell us about achievements you're most proud of? Well, I'm, I'm really proud of a lot of achievements, uh, partly for the role that I've played in raising the visibility 
of youth voices in climate, especially on the African continent. This, you know, the average age of this continent is 19 years old. I always remind myself, they are the ones who will lead us into the future. And so the, the role that we're playing at the Wangari Mathai Foundation is creating voices for young people to express themselves, to stand up for what they believe, and to begin to show that they themselves are ready for leadership, not always to look around for other people. So we create spaces for them to express themselves, to lead, but also to be part of solutions around um, all manner of issues. But youth leadership is one that is really important. The other one is really to continue the legacy of the Greenbelt Movement. Every year that passes, almost every week that passes, we get more clarity about the central importance of forest, the central importance of green, trees, plants, biodiversity, and how important it is for us to continue to support what my mother always called this life support system that supports all of us. And so I, I feel like that work is going to always be part of what I do, keeping that legacy going and keeping that message alive. So thank you, Vanjira. You are now the Vice President and Regional Director for Africa at the World Resources Institute. So could you tell us more what kind of initiatives you are taking forward in terms of ecosystem restoration for us in Africa? Yeah, you know, I think one of the things that I'm most proud of at the World Resources Institute is that we saw many years ago the urgency of this restoration movement. WRI has work in restoration across several countries in Cameroon, Ethiopia, Ghana, Kenya, Malawi, Rwanda, and Niger. And in all of those countries, we're looking at the role of restoration, especially in building back food, water, and energy security for both women, communities, youth, the most disadvantaged. Because we know restoring land is actually one of the most important things we can do to build resilience um, against climate and other impacts that will follow. So we're very proud of AFR 100, the initiative that is country-led, hosted by the African Union's NEPAD and, and AUDA now, and really leading the way in building a momentum around landscape restoration. Target of 100 million hectares by 2030. And this is a target that we, we initially thought when we were starting to build uh, attention around 100 million hectares. Will we ever make this target? Well, we made the target and we surpassed it. I think it's 128 million hectares now that have been committed. However, we now have to turn those commitments into action on the ground. And so we're very busy now at the World Resources Institute supporting countries in the countries that I've mentioned to begin to build plans, monitoring systems, and also begin to actually implement. And I'm particularly interested in the work that we will do supporting local organizations, build the necessary capacity, organizations like the Greenbelt Movement in Kenya and others to begin to build the capacity they need to scale up the sort of restoration activities, to begin to build the capacity for youth. We have an accelerator program that is working particularly on youth, the land accelerator, that will begin to in, inspire and build and equip young people with the skills they need to build businesses around uh, restoration. And so we know that there is a great economic opportunity there, but there's also a great opportunity to restore. We also love to matchmake. And so we also have opportunities to link entrepreneurs like that and small groups like that with funders through a platform called TerraMatch. So the World Resources Institute, I think, is bringing a whole toolbox of tools and platforms that we hope will play a catalytic role in making the AFR 100 agenda a reality. Lovely. That is so exciting. It's so wonderful to have you here. It's so relevant for our webinar on the International Day on Forest. So we are very lucky to have you with us. And now I would like to invite us all to see a short video about a very exciting project. It's actually the Great Green Wall for the Sahara and the Sahel Initiative. And it's the most ambitious climate change adaptation and mitigation response under implementation. So let us now please see the brief video.
My home is embattled by desertification and drought, migration and conflict. Restoring the land is a matter of survival. It's up to us to create an African dream. We're talking about revitalizing the ecosystem, the economy of communities and villages. The future generation will hold us accountable. People can't work their land. Millions across the region will be forced to migrate. The convoyer wants to donate to another convoyer. It's already been sold to this convoyer without being able to get rid of it. I've had four friends who took the ball. Ray, come to green. Bullo, 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 bullo. This is the real match. The ball is not set. The jack is not blue. The jack is blue. The Great Green Wall, it's not just about planting trees. It has to become a movement from the whole continent, from the whole world. So now I would like to welcome Louis Baker again, who is the Managing Director of the Global Mechanism at the UN Convention to Combat Desertification. And we're very happy to have you with us today. And we were now very excited to hear from you more about the Great Green Wall, if you could tell us more about this exciting project, which was already mentioned by your Executive Secretary in about the film. I know there are many people here in the audience who want to learn more about it, this exciting project, really a project of hope. So please tell us more about it. Thank you, Alexandra, and it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, yeah, it really is an exciting project. It's been going for a while. Um, African born, African created. Um, and yes, 8,000 kilometers from Dakar to Djibouti, um, trying to rehabilitate the land. The, the ambition is immense. The, the target is 100 million hectares to be restored, 250 million tons of carbon to be sequestered and 10 million jobs to be created. Um, we're probably about 20% of the way there. So there's still a very long way to go. Um, but I think it's, uh, as I think Ibrahim mentioned, it's an idea whose time has come. Um, recently in January, um, President Macron organized the One Planet Summit and, and Made a, um, made a big focus on the work around the Great Green Wall, um, where almost $16 billion of funding was announced for, um, for efforts to, to help work on completion of the wall by 2030. Um, the UNCCD will, be, uh, will run a little accelerator program to try and keep the, the fire under the feet of the donors to make sure that that money actually turns up and support the monitoring and impact efforts. But really it's in the hands of the Pan-African Agency for the Great Green Wall of the Sahel, um, of the Sahara and Sahel under the auspices of the African Union. It, it's really them that spearheading this and we're hopefully just there to help to, 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 give, it, to give it the kind of push. Um, it, really, it really is, I think, building on all of the ideas that the Honorable Minister uh, and Madame Matai talked about, it, it's really about redefining the narrative in the Sahel region. If you look at the Sahel region at the beginning of the film, you saw that, of the, of the trailer, you saw that it, the potential of the Sahel isn't really seen by people. It has a very negative narrative. In this vision for the future of revitalizing communities, creating value chains of Moringa and Baobab, of, of restoring the land, I think you're restoring 
optimism. It's a very optimistic view, but you're also creating opportunities, opportunities in the value chains themselves through uh, ecotourism, through sustainable energy, through locally produced products. Um, you're kind of, you're generating a sort of positive narrative for a region that doesn't really benefit from one at the moment, but it's really based on something substantial and you can see it changing before your eyes. Already 18 million hectares have been restored, 350,000 jobs created and 90 million uh, dollars of revenue being created already. And I think the potential there and the potential for this region, particularly for young people, is, is immense. Fantastic news also that there is now more funding for this important project that really will provide enhanced livelihoods, help to combat climate change, help to have more water security, food security. So my question would be, what can citizens do or what can policymakers do to support this exciting project? So, I mean, I think citizens, as, as Wajira said, it, it's not policymakers who are out in the communities making this happen on the ground. It's really not. Um, it's communities, it's women, it's young people getting their hands dirty, being creative, cr coming up with the value chains. There, there will be more resources coming in that will help with sustainable infrastructure, that will help with the kind of the... the the basic stuff but it really has to be kind of inspired by people the replication effect that when Jira talked about where you uh, and you, you mentioned actually in terms of seeing your uh, with with Rwanda seeing your neighbors 12 years later get rid of the plastic bags this kind of replication of success I think is going to be critical that people see see the success of a community that restores its land that replants its trees that makes clever choices about the trees that it plants because it mixes, well it sticks local, but it mixes economically productive resources. It gets its, certainly from a policy makers, its forest policy and its land management and its tenure, um, uh, tenure rules correct. When all of this comes together, the transformation is absolutely amazing. So Policymakers absolutely need to put their policy in place so that people can take advantage of this new environment and communities, we hope, will be inspired to replicate the success that they see and, and make this happen. I think for young people as well. Yes. I think for young yes. people, it's a choice. It's about giving people a choice. Actually, now they have, they have a choice. They can they can leave and they can run away, or they can be part of the solution. And they can they can build this community. It's an incredibly it's a community with huge potential. It can thrive when when we we put this environment back and we make it healthy. So thank you very much, Louise. I can actually see that there are some questions now already coming in. I think. Um, we now have here actually Patricia Combo. She is from the Pay Tree Initiative in Kenya and she's a youth present representative of World Future Council and UNCCD Land Hero. So welcome Patricia. I heard that you have a question. So please, what's your question? Uh, thank you very much for the invite and she has talked about choices and the youth. And my question is, what are the positive impacts that the Rwanda policy, forest policy, and Great Green Wall will love to us young people? Thank you. Thank you, Patricia, for your question. So here again, the significant question about the positive impacts of youth. So if we could hear from Louise, what would be the positive impacts for you from the Great Green Wall and also about the Rwanda forest policy? So for me, for the Great Green Youth, it's about um, decent work. It's about work that doesn't mean people just have to survive, they can thrive. It's about harnessing um, their creativity to come up with to come up with products and to come up with um, things that they can do that, that, add, that add real value so that they, they, they don't have to just be farmers. They can take those products and they can put them into a value chain. They can create ecotourism venues. They can, um, they can 
market and package wonderful African products, Baobab, Moringa, and get that into international markets. So it, it's more, it's, it's creating decent employment in rural areas for people. That means they have a choice to stay in their communities rather than have to go to a city or further afield. It's, it's giving them an opportunity, I think, and, and if they can engage in it, to revitalize their communities and build the communities that they want, that give them a decent income so they can plan their future and have a great perspective in their home communities. Excellent, and there's another question we just got about the Great Green Wall. The question is how it will be watered. <laughs> Okay, good question. Um, the, the, the trees that are being planted are all very definitely local trees that are naturally drought resistant. So we're not looking at a plantation here where we plant trees. In the Great Green Wall as well, it's not the kind of intense forestry that you might see in other places. There isn't enough water for that. Having said that, fascinating fact, um, I think it's, two percent but I'm, I'm going to need to go and check that i will check that and come back to you and confirm but actually africa uh, the the sahel region has got a lot of untapped water resources in it it actually is incredibly well incredibly may not but <laughs> underground water resources it's it's well supplied with water if it's managed carefully um it, in this region we don't want to over stock the forest we we aren't planning a, a you know, nobody is planning to create a, another amazon or congo basin here but trees in the landscape there is sufficient water if it's managed locally and it's managed well alexandra i just wanted to add as well and louise is absolutely right that there are also significant opportunities for farmer managed natural regeneration where there's opportunities to regenerate with material that is already in the ground and rooted. So these are really op re real opportunities in the Sahel. Thank you, Vanjira. And I actually now have a question to you by someone who asked a question on Facebook. So the efforts of the Vanjira Matai Foundation to strengthen youth leadership, what other possibilities exist to get young people more engaged and accepted as agents of change? That's such a good question because they're not so often that you get uh, young people invited. So we are actually working with a lot of young people who are creating their own spaces and creating their own platforms and supporting them. But one of the interesting opportunities that I think exists today is getting into local leadership, getting young people into political spaces, into local, national, regional political spaces, because there's a lot of opportunity for them there. And they are actually the majority in these spaces. So that's one area we feel that part of it being part of the change is getting into these spaces where traditionally we haven't seen young people. But I think also that what, what we've talked about, Louise mentioned it as well, restoration itself creates significant opportunities. A lot of people who are facing forced migration out of rural areas into the urban areas. We're talking a lot now about rural prosperity. There are real opportunities in agriculture and in forestry to unlock value chains that young people could benefit from. So I think there, is, there are some opportunities there, but we have a lot of work to do to create those spaces where they can access the capacity they need, the information they need to get started with these initiatives. Thank you. And there's a follow-up question from Mrs. Weiss in our webinar. She writes, thank you to the organizers and speakers for the great webinar and fantastic contributions. It is great to hear that the Vangari Matai Institute, for example, involves and empowers youth through their work. My question is, what can young people do to contribute to revitalizing forests? And also the Rwanda minister, what are examples of youth activities going on on the ground in Rwanda? Yeah, I think we've talked both about, about the one, certainly about what young people can do in forestry. The, the AFR 100 secretariat in Nepal in South Africa has an entire uh, program focused on youth uh, in restoration and, and youth, essentially youth champions in restoration with a real mission to create 
a restoration generation. I think therein lies some real opportunities for young people to engage and reach out to NEPAD and reach out through all sorts of media technology that you have access to, to begin to find out how can I engage in the AFR 100? How can I engage in the Great Green Wall Initiative? That there are real opportunities there to unlock value across different value chains. Excellent. Thank you so much, Fanjira. Then there's another question about the Great Green Wall. The question is, what percentage has been so far covered by the Great Green Wall project? And what challenges have you so far undergone? Louise, could you please answer? Yes, I can try. Um, there, was, um, there was an assessment last year, a state of the Great Green Wall, and it suggests that about 20% has been completed so far. Um, so there's still a very long way to go, um, but I think it's kind of, uh, perhaps everything has sort of come together. As I said, idea whose time has come. It, it, it is a good response to post-COVID recovery. It is an absolutely spot on re response to the achievement in the decade of action for the sustainable development goals. Um, so I think there's, it's a flagship for the decade of ecosystem restoration. It responds to many of the challenges that um, the challenges that we see in um, in the, the Sahel region. Anyway, I would say, yeah, I mean, what the challenges we face. I think political commitment always. I would say um, resources and getting them down to the communities that actually do the work always. Um, I and maybe some enabling environment questions, things around gender inclusion, youth inclusion, tenure and access. I did wanna come on just quickly back and announce maybe um, that at the end of last year, we, uh, we were involved with some work on the, with the G20 and they um, announced at the end of last year, a, a new global initiative to uh, reduce land degradation and promote the conservation of terrestrial ecosystems, fo fo focusing on the restoration agenda with a particular stream on youth. So th this is still in the kind of design phase at the moment, but we're hoping that that also will enable us to engage, um, will enable us to engage more actively in, in, in ensuring that youth have a real voice in that, uh, ecopreneurs and that sort of thing. And Mr. Jalal Udin is now asking Mrs. Baker, what is the size of the budget for the Great Green Wall? Could you answer that? Now you are muted, yes. Um, it will probably in the, be in the range of 33 billion. So it's a big budget. But as we said, at this One Planet Summit in January, um, 16 billion has been pledged. So we're well on our way. Um, I think we now have to prove success. So this has, to, this has to be an alignment of the funds that are coming in through different sources, EPF, the World Bank, JEF, national governments and local authorities. So I think we have to de demonstrate success. So I was wondering if the Honourable Minister is still with us. Maybe we cannot see her at the moment. There were some questions to her concerning yes, the impact. I, I'm, I'm online, but uh, my video was, uh, was a shot from your side. Okay, so we try to rearrange the video, please. If we can see her again. Oh, so now we can see you well again. Thank you so much for being with us again. So just, yeah. um, there were some questions again. About yeah, thank you. There was a question, how do youth in Rwanda benefit and are engaged in the reforestation and forest policy? Of course, the youth of Rwanda um, is the active force for our country because most of them live in the rural areas. So the Rwanda Forest Policy encourages schools and the youth organizations to grow and conserve trees from the schools. And now the policy of the government is to, to, to mobilize children, not from the schools, even in preschool age, from home, so that every child 
should plant a tree at home, at least a fruit tree. So we've made in Rwanda dry sustainable forest management and involvement of private investment in the management of public forest. Jobs are created for youth, women, and even disabled people because we believe that disability does not mean inability in making Rwanda greener. So we have youth organizations that are given priority and put in centers of creative promotions and green jobs. The government has created many polytechnic schools and what technology sciences are included to increase knowledge on wood processing. We have those, those organizations like Eco Brigade, Green Fighters, Wanda Youth in Action. And in those polytechnic schools, the renewable energy is a department apart. So young people are now working in the forest planting, timber production, furniture production, and timber processing centers are created throughout the, the country. So young people are more engaged in small and medium enterprises in the wood processing as well as forest management generally. So without that force, that active force of young people who would not reach where we have reached now. Thank you. There is one other question, uh, Honorable Minister. It's about Rwanda policy. It is how you were able to create economic growth and perhaps how we can learn from it today when facing an economic crisis after the pandemic in terms of ah. green recovery. Thank you, thank you very much. Actually, how we, we could recover from, from the aftermath of uh, COVID, even if it is not over, but we made sure that all projects the, uh, that are involved with the environment protection, forest, reforestation, all these projects, which most, most of the time are, are read by young people, they were given a, a green right to continue to operate while others were, at, were in lockdown at home. Those environment projects continued to operate. So that shows you the, the worth and the, the value the country is giving to environment projects. And we were the only one who were given green right to continue movement throughout the country. And of course, as the country was in, in school construction, preparing for the school year to restart after COVID, after lockdown, this year alone, Rwanda has built 22,000 classrooms. And those 22,000 classrooms they used timbers from forests that were planted by young people. So not only we recovered better in the forest, but our young people got uh, economic uh, uh, em empowerment so that they could again uh, put up for three seed nurseries for the next year's uh, plantation because every October to March we have planting tree season. So now throughout the country you will find that because we have built 22,000 class, 22, classrooms, the population is now putting up nurseries for replanting or, or planting new forests to replace the used uh, wood, the used timber pro, uh, produced during the construction of classrooms. And those classrooms were built 
to be able to keep distance between students so that uh, so that we 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 keep the measures of COVID at the same time creating employment and empowering our education system. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And there's a follow-up question to the minister from Jalal Uldin Shoyab. He's asking, how is the outcome shared from the planting of forests to the community or to local organizations such as Green Fighters? How is the outcome shared with them? Yes, those Green Fighters, it is a, a youth organization, Green Fighters, Eco Brigade. When we are talking about Green Fighters, Eco Brigade, as I said, they are given priority when there is a tender of reforesting one or many parts of the country. So those Green Fighters or Eco Brigade, they are very much involved in uh, fighting soil erosion in reforesting our country. So actually the, the, the money that the government uh, takes from the coffin of the Minister of Finance, it goes directly to those organizations. So it empowers the rural area. So you can see there, the, uh, now there is less movement of young people from rural area to the city because the government has created jobs in the rural area so that there is no movement, uh, there is no exodus from, from rural area to the capital city. People know that money and jobs are there in the rural area. Excellent, so that's so exciting. So now that we have uh, two more questions to Louise. It's a very great interest about the Great Green Wall as well. So the question is, could we learn more about how the Great Green Wall can create economic prosperity and perhaps how we can learn from it when facing an economic crisis after a pandemic? And the second question is, the Great Green Wall is oriented to rural areas, question mark. If it's, how does it deal with the small bridge between urban areas and rural areas and related to the growing population? And which policies or strategies should be included to guarantee a long, the long lasting of the project? You could have a, you could have a webinar just on those two questions. Yes. I, okay, I will be very brief on them, and I, whoever that was, I'd love to continue that conversation. Um, I think mostly it's about making rural areas environmentally, socially, and economically viable. By creating these value chains, I mean, working the land, it's, it's hard work. Planting trees, agriculture, it, it's hard, physical work a lot of the time. So we are counting on a young and vibrant African youth population <laughs> to put the hard work in. But I think that that creates a real dynamic in the economy. I think that the COVID has shown us that we're shrinking, we're shrinking supply chains actually. So I think there's lots of urban areas, growing urban areas in Africa that should be supplied from the value chains from their hinterlands. Uh, Lagos in Nigeria springs to mind that it, they, they import huge numbers of tomatoes. So it should be that we can supply the tomato market of Lagos from revitalized economic, uh, revitalized um, land in, in the region. Um, I certainly, um, I think planning a green recovery, it's about putting a, a base, particularly in uh, communities that rely on the natural resource base. It's about grounding that so that everybody can at least survive they can at least feed their families and have enough resources to, to, be, uh, to be stable. Um, and then we're looking forward to, to sort of to build forward and build economic opportunities in the future. I think most communities in most parts of the world would benefit from that same sort of grounding of the natural resource base to build up from. 
In terms of peri-urban and urban areas, I think that's right. Similar to the Lagos experience, um, people are being forced off the land from rural areas because it's no, no longer productive. They can't feed their families in rural areas, so they go looking for economic opportunities. I think there's a balance there to be had to say if you make rural areas dynamic and viable, um, you can create opportunities that give them a choice to say, I want to stay in my community in a rural area. I can stay here and I can grow things and I can grow my, grow my future. And people can also go to rural areas because uh, to, to urban areas because they're, they're shiny and they're exciting. It's, it's not saying that people can't move, but it's giving them a choice to make sure that that balance between urban and rural is maintained. And Louise, Richard Watea would like to know how much of the project's target area has been covered so far? Well, so it's interesting in that there's a very specific target area, but in fact, what we're seeing is just like, uh, just like was mentioned earlier on, there's real replication. So it's about 20% of the, of the target has currently been uh, achieved, but then you're seeing replication outside of the target area because good practice gets replicated. So I think, yeah, there's, there's the specific area that was targeted by the initial plans when that was, that was dreamed up 15 years ago. And then I think there's the kind of the ripple effect of good practice being taken up by people outside of that area. Questions to the minister. Can we see her again, please? So the question is, Patricia Combo is asking, I like to run the forest policy, but integrating the school pupils into the tree growing. The question is, do they have a curricula in place, which is used to teach pupils about the importance of forest and nature? And the second question comes from Kaganga John. He's asking, in Uganda, there's still illegal logging and charcoal burning. And this is still a big problem in Uganda. How about the situation in Rwanda as a neighboring country? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, um, actually, we have environment curriculum in schools. In uh, primary schools, we have uh, environment curriculum which was developed in, in connect, uh, between the Ministry of Environment, represented by Rwanda Environment Management Authority with the Ministry of Education. So we have curriculum. We have Excellent. only to, to continue the inspection to make sure that children understand and go on the ground to see what they have been taught and to go home, practice, what they have been taught in schools. Actually, children have become our ambassadors in their families. On the issue of charcoal, uh, actually the government has uh, decided to start burning charcoal use in the big cities, starting by the capital city. But COVID has disturbed the initiatives so the government has now subsidized the, the liquefied petroleum gas by increasing the incentives to the people who are in LPG business. So that the, the price of LPG has come down from 30,000 Rwandan franc to now 15,000 Rwandan francs. So the government has subsidized that business. And of course, we are continuing training and uh, sensitizing our population because the use of charcoal is more expensive than the use of LPG. Even when you count the, the, money, the money side of it, without counting the deforestation that takes charcoal use, but people have started understanding and together with the Ministry of Health, we are mobilizing the population for them to know that most of the respiratory disease that are coming out of using of biomass are preventable if we use LPG. I thank you. 
Thank you so much. I would now like to come to the concluding round of the three panelists. We all know 2021 is a critical year. We have the pandemic, but we also have upcoming conferences at the UN on combating desertification, on climate, and on biodiversity. So first of all, um, there's the first question is in how far the pandemic has affected your program and your work and what we can learn from it. And then of course, the second question really is, um, which are the required policy measures that should be taken in this important year to move forwards to green recovery and for more health of people, planet and animal? animals. So can I please start asking the question, um, just a concluding round, a short statement on these two points. We start with Vanjira, please. Thank you, Alexandra. It's been a, a lovely conversation and lovely listening to the other panelists. Well, COVID-19 has changed everything. I think it's changed everything for all of us, um, how we almost think about the way forward uh, we're still in it for many of us in the third wave. So I think it, how we move forward and build forward better is, is really going to be something we think really hard about. What is going to be absolutely undeniable is the importance of ensuring the integrity of nature. Uh, what COVID taught us is that biodiversity and uh, the barriers that have kept biodiversity in place and intact need to be respected and we need to make sure that we do not encroach into areas and, and in this international uh, day of forest I hope that that will be a resounding message. I think it was a really stark and tragic reminder to us that we need to protect and maintain the barriers between humans and, um, and nature. Now the other thing about um, policies. I, I love this emerging paradigm that seems to be coming up, that we need to produce food uh, better. We need to invest in more efficient and sustainable food systems, because that is a, an extremely vulnerable place for us going forward. How Africa produces its food, how most of the global South produce their food is really going to be important. Shortening supply chains and making sure we are not open to vulnerability. So that, that's the produce. And there's policy around protection, protection of green spaces around our cities, around our countries, that whatever lung you have in your country, it's really precious. It's really important that we maintain the health and integrity of greenways in our cities, green spaces that have really been during this COVID time, a, a space of solace and mental uh, health for those of us who've had them, and that we continue to put in place policies that protect green spaces wherever they may be. And then, of course, there's reduce, reducing waste, especially around post-harvest losses. We lose a lot of food, we waste a lot of food, and looking at opportunities for better storage, cold storage, so that we can do even better with the food that we have. And then finally, the subject of this discussion today, restore. We need to deepen our commitment to restoring. And the World Resources Institute, this is something we are really committed to. We're committed to supporting governments in Africa to continue to restore the landscapes and to continue to push initiatives like the Great Green Wall, like AFR 100, that we might restore um, hundreds of thousands of hectares of land into productivity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vanjira, for this inspiring call for action on so many important topics which really show how we can move forward actually to build many people say build back better but actually also build forward even in a better way that's why we're organizing the forward thinking webinars with you we're happy to hear about all of your suggestions so i'd like to move on to now the honorable minister again to hear her view about how the pandemic has also impacted your countries, which are the required policy measures for green recovery? Yeah, uh, thank you very much. The pandemic, as my friend uh, Matai was saying, the pandemic has affected everything 
without leaving uh, the environment sector specifically, especially uh, when we are talking about the effect of COVID-19. In Rwanda, there has been two types of effect, positive and negative. Positive, as I told you, the environment sector was given a green right to continue movement while other sectors were in lockdown. So we had time to, to restore our landscape and it was really, uh, we could implement the forest landscape restoration as a strategy to reverse widespread degradation. We were able to, to restore our water catchment and we were able also to improve the, our air quality monitoring. Because as you know, there were no movement, there were no motorbike, no vehicles, the air improved. And we could strategize to, to increase even our car-free zones in the cities, our car-free zones up countries. So negatively, it has affected because this pandemic came at the same time with a heavy rain in Rwanda, a heavy rain that destroyed some of the infrastructures and some of the wetlands uh, were affected. So when we are talking about um, the impact the positive impact that we had during this pandemic, it was not only the Ministry of Environment or the environment in general, even the, min the activities of agriculture were given green right. So we have produced enough food and we have been able to, to go into digital system that now the young people who are in environment projects now are supplying through online, online, they are supplying their product. And again, as I told you, the children are our ambassadors in their families. Now, at least the increase of kitchen garden in families has seen at least 40% of increase during the pandemic than before the pandemic. It is good, but of course, uh, we have to keep the momentum so that people consume bio product and consume local made product without going into importation of food, but rather going into exportation of food stuff that we have uh, we have got during the pandemic and of course keep the momentum as it is thank you and what would be the relevant measures that are now required in this critical year uh, of 2021 we have upcoming negotiations on desertification on climate and biodiversity we have the opportunity for green recovery so just, Minister, if you could just say a few words about this very important opportunity that we have and also learning from the experience of Rwanda. Yeah, learning from the experience of Rwanda, I think I would rather run from my other panelists as they were presenting. I think we have to run from each other. The South-South cooperation should really be now. South-South mm -hmm. cooperation. I don't need to go to China to learn how to restore our landscape, to learn how to reforest our country. When my neighbor, Wanjira Matai in Kenya, is doing the same, I don't need to send my youth organization in other continent when in the Kenya, in Tanzania, they are doing the same. So we have to run from each other and to, to tell ourselves that together we can strive 
and we can make this world greener and safer for the next generation to come. Thank you. It's a beautiful ending, wonderful to hear from you. So let me now turn to Louise to hear from her about how the pandemic has impacted you. What are the policy opportunities for this year? You currently have negotiations going on also at UNCCD. We are in the middle of our review, yes, of implementation. I'm not sure it's very easy to follow either Wenjir or the Honourable Minister in, in summing up that. Um, so I will be very, very brief. Yes, it's exciting times in the sense, it's, again, it's changed everything. I think what it has done is it's underlined that you only get resilient and empowered people if you have a resilient environment. Um, and so the pressure that the COVID has put on, on everybody has highlighted where we aren't resilient, actually, and that goes everywhere, and it, particularly in Africa, but not just in Africa. So where we don't have a resilient environment, we don't have resilient people, and I think that's, that's so clear. And moving forward, as, as I think in our negotiations, and I'm sure that that's going on in many places, we need to make sure that the plans that build forward better mainstream this environmental component into them and then the plans get turned into action because i think there's a kind of there's 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 often quite a reactive approach to a crisis and this isn't going to be the only time this happens to us so building the resilience of the environment and the resilience of the people it's it's a very smart investment now and it's it will will reap rewards for generations to come i think i'm gonna stop there thank you very much well thank you so much so i would like to really thank our uh, esteemed panelists the honorable minister vanjiro matai louise baker from unccd for accepting to share your time and your knowledge with us and we are very grateful for that and we want to thank all cheers participants and listeners who joined here on Zoom and also on Facebook. So we thank you all for your time and for your questions and listening. And we hope you will all become now ambassadors of forest and ecosystem restoration in your various communities and help us protect them because they are our future. So I would like to thank UNCCD also, the entire team at the World Future Council have worked very tirelessly to prepare the webinar. Also Miriam Peterson, Anna Lara Steen, Maurice Wokul, Annika Weiss, and all the staff engaged. And thank you for your efforts and your dedication. And so we also want to invite you. This has been the Forward Thinkers webinar series on forest. We will have more webinar series coming up on health, on biodiversity, on oceans. We are part of the UN decade on ecosystem restoration, and we are looking into really solutions, proven policy solutions, and also presenting our future policy award winners. And so we invite you to follow us also on social media, join us for upcoming webinars, or have a look into our website. So thank you so much again for joining us and see you another time, and then enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexandra, for Thank you. a wonderful uh, Congratulations again for your achievements. Yeah, and I invite you to join us next week, celebrating the International Day of Forest, Water, and Meteorology on 23rd. We have a wonderful webinar. Please join us. Thank you. Thank you. We will look forward to that. Thank and you, Wanjira. Thank, Thank you, Louise. Thank, Thank you, you. everybody. It's a yeah, pleasure. Thank you so you. much, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye.